السلام عليكم ورحمة الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد All thanks and praise are due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and may his peace and blessings upon his last and final messenger, his family, his companions and those who follow them until the end of times. So alhamdulillah, last Friday, uh, we were able to explore the lessons and meanings of verses 33 uh, and partially 34. So inshallah, tonight the plan is to explore verses 34 through 36. And we'll start like we do every week by reciting the verses themselves. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولقد أنزلنا إليكم آيات مبينات ومثلا من الذين خلوا من قبلكم ومثلا من الذين خلوا من قبلكم وموعظة للمتقين الله نور السماوات والأرض مثل نوره كمشكاة فيها مصباح المصباح في زجاجة الزجاجة كأنها كوكب دري يوقد من شجرة مباركة يوقد من شجرة مباركة زيتونة لا شرقية ولا غربية يكاد زيتها يضيء ولو لم تمسسه نار نور على نور يهدي الله لنوره من يشاء ويضرب الله الأمثال للناس والله بكل شيء عليم في بيوت أذن الله أن ترفع ويذكر فيها اسمه يسبح له فيها بالغدو والآصال. So this last passage that we were exploring, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned a few different legal rulings uh, related to marriage as well as encouraging people to get married and then he prohibited some certain things and now he ends the passage by highlighting three unique aspects of the surah and three unique aspects of the Qur'an in general. So in verse number 34, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, وَلَقَدْ أَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكُمْ آيَاتٍ مُبَيِّنَاتٍ We have truly sent down upon you clarifying signs. We have truly sent down upon you clarifying verses. وَمَثَلًا مِنَ الَّذِينَ خَلَوْ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ And a description of those who have passed before you. Or an example of those who have passed before you. وَمَوْعِظَةً لِلْمُتَّقِينَ And a reminder for the people of God consciousness. So the first aspect that's highlighted is آيَاتٍ مُبَيِّنَاتٍ which is translated as clarifying signs or clarifying verses. The word آيَات, it is the plural of the word آيَة which literally means a sign. And usually a sign is a tool that is used to give us directions. We follow signs in order to reach our desired destination. So for example, all around the masjid, there are these various signs that give us various pieces of information. Right? The exit sign tells me that I exit this way. Another sign tells me that the fire extinguisher is there. Another sign is telling me that the donation box is there. So similarly in the Qur'an, every single verse is an ayah. Every single verse is a sign that's directing and pointing us towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the verses of the Qur'an, they have been called ayat, because each of them is a sign of the divine. They are signs of Allah's oneness, might, power, existence, magnificence, and glory. And they are described as mubayyinat. They are described as clarifying, meaning that they are extremely clear. They explain clearly the path to guidance, faith, and salvation. They explain and clarify the laws and injunctions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, both His commands and prohibitions. And the word mubayyinat, it actually conveys a dual meaning. One of them is that it's clear in and of itself. Meaning the words of the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has expressed them in very clear terms. That anyone who has a basic understanding of the Arabic language will at least understand the surface level meaning of these words and will be able to extract guidance from it. And the second meaning 
is that they are clarifying as well. That not only are the words clear in and of themselves, but they also clarify things for us as human beings. They clarify false from truth, or they clarify truth from falsehood, and faith from disbelief, and morality from immorality. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing the verses of the surah in specifically, and the verses of the Qur'an in general, as ayatim mubayyinat, clarifying signs, clarifying verses. The second aspect that's highlighted is that the Qur'an contains مَثَلًا مِنَ الَّذِينَ خَلَوْ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ A description or an example of those who have passed before you. So the Qur'an contains the stories and narratives of past nations that we can study, analyze, and derive practical lessons from. And that's one of the main objectives, one of the main reasons why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions these narratives in the Qur'an. That one of the most common themes or common subjects of the Qur'an is stories of past nations and past prophets. And they're not being meant for the sake of historical information. They're not just being mentioned for the sake of mentioning a story. Rather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to learn lessons from them. So for example, Surah An-Nur, it contains the story of Ifk, which shares similar themes and lessons with the stories of Yusuf alayhi salam, as well as Maryam alayhi salam. Meaning parallels can be drawn between all three of these incidents and the stories and narratives of the Quran they are extremely eloquent they're extremely beautiful but most importantly they are very instructive they contain several lessons guidance and morals that we can extract so that we can implement them into our daily lives and that's one aspect of these stories the other aspect is that they serve as consolation to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi and by extension to the entire ummah that in these examples we find prophets going through difficulties and hardships and trials and tribulations. And in these stories, in these examples, we find consolation, we find comfort, we find reminders to remain patient and steadfast and strong, especially in the face of adversity and different challenges. So the second aspect that's being highlighted is that this surah in particular and the Qur'an in general contain several examples of past nations that came before us. The third aspect that is highlighted is that the Qur'an is a reminder for the God conscious. مَوْعِظَةً لِلْمُتَّقِينَ Now the word مَوْعِظَة, it comes from the word وَعَظَة. And the verb وَعَظَة in the Arabic language, it can contain se- several different meanings. One of them being to give a reminder, to give a sermon, to give a religious exhortation. It can also mean to like um, advise. So there's all these different meanings contained within مَوْعِظَة. But the most comprehensive description is that a mo'idah is something that's meant to shake a person's heart. That it creates a sense of fear at the same time creating a sense of hope. That it actually pulls upon a person's emotional strings and it speaks directly to their heart. And that's exactly what the verses of the Qur'an do. That if a person engages with the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it has a direct effect upon their hearts and their minds as well. But the people that benefit most from it are al-muttaqeen, the people of God consciousness, those who are aware and conscious of their Lord and Creator. So the Qur'an is a powerful, powerful reminder for the people of taqwa, the people of God consciousness, those who recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the all-hearing, the all-seeing, all-knowing, almighty, and all-powerful. So this is a very brief, yet actually comprehensive description of not only this particular surah, but the Qur'an in general. And that is something that should be understood from this verse. That first and foremost, again, the verses of the Qur'an, they are clear and clarifying. Secondly, the Qur'an contains examples and stories of past nations that we're supposed to derive lessons from. And it's مَوْعِظَةً لِلْمُتَّقِينَ It is a reminder for the people of taqwa. Now the next verse is where Surah An-Nur gets its name from. It's called Ayat An-Nur. It's called the verse of light. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts by saying, Allahu nuru samawati wal ard. Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. Mathanu nurihi kamishkatin fiha misbah. The parable, the example of his light is in a niche. Al misbahu fi zujaja. And in this niche there is a lamp and the lamp is inside of a glass. Az zujaja tu ka endaha kaukabun durri. 
and the glass is as a shining star. يُقَدُ مِنْ شَجَرَةٍ مُبَارَكَةٍ زَيْتُونَةٍ لَا شَرْقِيَةٍ وَلَا غَرْبِيَةٍ And it's kindled from a blessed olive tree, neither of the east nor the west. يَكَادُ زَيْتُهَا يُضِيءُ وَلَوْ لَمْ تَمْسَ السُّنَارِ Its oil would shine forth even if no fire had touched it. نُورٌ عَلَى نُورٌ Light upon light. يَهْدِ اللَّهُ لِنُورِهِ مَنْ يَشَاءٍ Allah guides to His light whomsoever He wills. وَيَضْرِبُ اللَّهُ الْأَمْثَالَ لِلنَّاسِ And Allah gives examples for mankind. وَاللَّهُ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمٍ And Allah is the knower of all things. So this is a very beautiful, a very powerful, a very profound verse of the Qur'an. It's the famous verse of light, Ayatul Nur, from which the surah takes its name. And it's one of the most famous and perhaps often recited verses of the Qur'an. And many masajid throughout the world, they decorate their lamps and walls with this verse in beautiful calligraphy. Even here at IOK, our main dome right there is this verse, right? That, that verse up there in the dome is Ayatun Nur, Allahu Nuru Samawati Wal Ard. And there have also been a number of independent treatises uh, or treaties and books written on this particular verse. So, for example, Imam Al Ghazali, Rahimahullah, he has a book entitled Mishkatul Anwar. The niche of the lights or the niche of the lamps In which he discusses this verse and its meanings at great length So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He starts the verse by saying Allahu nuru samawati wal ard That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the light of the heavens and the earth Now light, nur Is considered to be one of the divine names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala So in several places throughout the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us some of His divine names and attributes. So one of the divine names that has been chosen and given to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by Himself is An-Nur. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the light. And Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu ma he narrated that when the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would get up to pray at night, he would say the following, Allahumma laka alhamd, anta qayyumu samawati wal ardi wa man fihim, wa laka alhamd, أَنْتَ نُورُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَنْ فِيهِمْ That, O oh Allah, all thanks and praise belong to you. You are the sustainer of the heavens and the earth and whoever is in them. And وَلَكَ الْحَمْدِ All praise and thanks belong to you again. أَنْتَ نُورُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَنْ فِيهِمْ You are the light of the heavens and the earth and whoever is in them. Similarly, Abu Dhar رضي الله عنه narrated that he asked the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم did you see your Lord? Meaning on the ascension to the heavens, on the journey of Isra wal Mi'raj. When the Prophet ﷺ traveled through the heavens and when he came back, Abu Dhar radiallahu an asked the Prophet ﷺ, Did you see your Lord? Hal ra'ayta rabbak? So the Prophet ﷺ responded by saying, Nurun anna arahu. Light, how could I see him? So one of the divine names given to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is An Nur. And now light is the opposite of darkness. Imam Al-Ghazali rahimahullah, he defines it as something that is manifest and apparent in and of itself and makes other things manifest and apparent. Al-Zahiru bi nafsihi wal-mudhiru li ghayrihi. He's describing the nature and quality of light. That it's al-Zahiru bi nafsihi. It's apparent in and of itself. And wal-mudhiru li ghayrihi. And it clarifies and it makes other things manifest. It makes other things clear and visible as well. So the meaning is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who illuminates the entire universe and everything that it contains. That Allah nuru samawati wal ard, yani munawwiru samawati wal ard. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who has illuminated the earth and the heavens and every single thing that they contain. And through this light, through this nur, he guides humanity to his existence, oneness, might, power, magnificence, and glory. And part of that light, part of that illumination and radiance is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to his prophets and messengers. So part of that nur, or one of the expressions of that nur, is revelation that he sent down to all the prophets and messengers. Specifically that that was sent to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam in the form of the Qur'an. And whoever is guided by this divine light and their heart is illuminated with the guidance of Allah has attained success of both this world 
and the next. And that's how Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma would explain it. He would say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the light of the heavens and the earth. That Allah nurus samawati wal ard means that He is the guide of those in the heavens and the earth. Because light is something that is used to provide guidance. Especially when it's dark, when the path is not clear, when there's obstacles in the way, when people can't see their surroundings. That you bring a torch, you bring a flashlight, you put on the lights, and everything becomes clear and clarified. So similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through this nur and through this illumination, guides mankind to a way of life that is pleasing to Him. That He is the one who gives them their existence, and the law that governs such existence. And it also means that Allah alone is the one who directs the affairs of the heavens and the earth. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions a very beautiful example, a parable to describe the light of faith inside of a believer's heart. So part of this nur is this flame of iman inside of each of our hearts. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us an example to help us understand this concept. To give us a deeper understanding of the reality of Iman. So Allahu Nurus Samawati Wal Ard. Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. Mathanu Nurihi Kamishkatin Fiha Misbah. The example of his light is a niche. Right? Mathanu Nurihi Kamishkat. The example of his light is like a niche. Fiha Misbah. Inside of this niche there is a lamp. Al-Misbahu fi Zujaja. The lamp is inside of a glass case. Az-Zujajatu ka'annaha kawkabun durri. The glass case is as a shining star. Yuqadu min shajaratim mubaraka zaytuna. Kindled from a blessed olive tree. La sharqiyatin wa la gharbiyya. Neither of the east nor of the west. Yakadu zaytuha yudhi'u wa law lam tamsas hunar. Its oil would shine. The oil would give off light even if no fire had touched it. Nurun ala nur, light upon light. So his light in this verse, right? Mathalu nurihi, the example of his light is referring to the light of Iman inside of each of our hearts. Right? Mathalu nurihi, the example of his light. The commentators say it's referring to the light of Iman in each of our hearts. The light of Iman and the light of the Qur'an. It is the nur of guidance that illuminates the heart of a believer. And the word mishka is translated as a niche, which is a recess or a space in a wall within which to set or hang a lamp. Right? If you, if you put, were to put like a little recess space inside of a wall, that's what's referred to as a niche. And misbah is translated as a lamp, which refers to the lighted wick itself which is then encased in a zujaja or a glass. So we're being given this very elaborate and detailed description of an illuminated lamp enclosed within a glass case that has been placed inside of a niche. So the example being given is like there's a wicker, right? There's a, there's a little flame. That's the lamp. That's the misbah. This flame is inside of a glass case, just like in the olden days where we had lanterns, right? And that lantern was being fueled by oil. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving a similar example that we have this flame, we have this light that's being fueled by olive oil. And this light is enclosed within a glass case. And then this glass case is put inside of a niche. And the glass is as a shining star kindled from a blessed olive tree. And this is referring to the special olive oil that is the fuel for this particular lamp. And this olive tree is described as la sharqiyatin wa la gharbiya. It's not from the east nor the west. Meaning, it is not in the eastern part of the land so that it does not get any sun in the first part of the day. Nor is it in the western part of the land so that it is shaded from the sun before sunset. But it is in a central location where it gets sun from the beginning of the day until the end. So its oil is good, pure, and shining. So basically Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by saying, لا شرقية ولا غربية is explaining the quality and purity of the olive oil itself. And Mujahid, a famous commentator from amongst the Tabi'un, he said, it is not in the east where it will get no sun when the sun sets, nor is it in the west where it will get no sun when the sun rises, but it is in a position where it will get sun both at sunrise and sunset. 
So basically, its oil is pure and of the absolute highest quality. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says that the oil would give off light. Right? The oil would radiate with light even if no fire had touched it. It's so pure that the oil is already radiant even before being ignited. And Ar-Razi rahimullah he mentions that the oil of an olive tree when it is pure and viewed from a distance looks as if it has rays coming from it and a fire only increases that. So the imagery that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is creating is that of an intense and bright light radiating from a lamp placed in a niche fueled by pure olive oil and shining through a glass. And all of this description and this imagery is to paint the imagery of a very bright and focused light. Right? A very, very bright, intense, focused flame. Because when you put the, the lamp inside of a niche, the purpose of it is to give it focus. So that the light is not spreading in every single direction, but it's shooting outwards in a particular manner, in a particular way. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is creating imagery of a very bright, a very radiant, a very sharp light. So the commentators mention that the niche is the chest of a believer. Right? This niche inside of a wall, like where the projector is, that niche is the, is the chest of a believer. The light radiating from the lamp is the Qur'an and Iman. Right? That light that is coming out of the lamp is the light of Iman, it's the light of the Qur'an, and the glass case is the heart itself. So that's the example, that is the parable, that's the metaphor that's being explained. That every single human being has this chest, which is our niche. Inside of this niche, we have a lamp that is enclosed within our hearts. And the, the fuel of that lamp is our Iman and the Qur'an. And once we have this Iman and Qur'an, it shines forth very intensely bright and radiant. All right, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is describing the heart of a believer in this very, very beautiful way in order to help us understand the concept of Iman. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He illuminates our hearts with Iman, guidance, and the Qur'an. The olive oil, the fuel, is the natural light that is placed in the heart of every single believer. And when this fuel is ignited through guidance and knowledge, it burns brighter and stronger. So that's one of the explanations given for this particular example. That مَثَلُ نُورِهِ is referring to the example of Iman, guidance, and Qur'an, that light inside of our hearts. Another explanation is that this verse is a description of the Prophet That when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying مَثَلُ نُورِهِ كَمَشْكَاتٍ فِيهَا مصباح, He's giving us a metaphorical, beautiful description of the Prophet so Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, he asked Ka'ab radiallahu an how he would explain this part of the verse. So he said that this example is describing the heart of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The niche is referring to his chest, the glass is his heart, and the lamp is prophethood. That the niche is the chest of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Right? The glass case is his heart, and the light is the light of prophethood and messengership. That the Prophet ﷺ, he was radiant even before revelation came to him. That he had this natural radiance, this natural light inside of his heart, even before being appointed as a prophet and messenger. His light was clear to people even before he spoke. And then once he received revelation, once he received guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that nur intensified. It became sharper, it became brighter and it spread to a further distance. So regardless of which explanation we take, the light that is being referred to is the light of faith, the light of guidance, and the light of the Qur'an. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Nurun ala nur, light upon light. That it's light compounded upon light. And this is a beautiful and profound statement that has been explained in several different ways. That this is a symbol for the faith of a believer. Some of the Mufassir would mention that it's referring to faith and action. Nurun ala nur. That once a person has this nur inside of their heart, once they have iman inside of their heart, it expresses itself through their behavior and through their speech. So that behavior in speech that's built upon light is light upon light. Nurun ala nur. Or to the light of the Quran together with the light of the believer. 
Another commentator mentioned that light of the fire and light of the oil, when they are combined, give a bright, radiant light. Neither of them can give light without the other. Similarly, the light of the Qur'an and the light of faith give light when they are combined. That when a person has iman, that's a, that's a type of radiance, that's a type of illumination. But in order for it to become brighter and stronger, to become more effective, to become more pronounced, to spread out to a further distance, it has to be coupled with this understanding of the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam al-Ghazali rahimahullah, he gives a very esoteric explanation. Right? He writes that the niche, the glass, the wick, the tree and oil represent different levels of perception and consciousness. That the niche, the glass, the wick, the tree and oil, they represent levels of perception and consciousness. The niche represents the physical senses that receive light passively. The glass represents the imagination, which like clay transformed into glass is purified through spiritual discipline. The lighted wick symbolizes the soul's power to understand meanings and ideas. The blessed olive tree represents the power of meditation and reflection. Each branch giving rise to two branches, with each giving rise to more. The oil that would well shine forth is the knowledge and consciousness possessed by the prophets and friends of Allah. And these levels of perception and consciousness are then light upon light. Nurun ala nur. So nurun ala nur is the faith of a believer whose heart has been illuminated by the guidance of Allah in the Qur'an that translates into speech and action. And that's one of the more practical explanations. That nurun ala nur. And that is supposed to be the reality of Iman. That once Iman truly settles inside of a person's heart, it expresses itself in every single thing that that person does. In their speech, their behavior, the conduct, the way they carry themselves, their perceptions, their worldview, their morals, their values, their principles, ethics. Every single thing becomes an expression of that faith. And that becomes nurun ala nur, light upon light. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, يَهْدِ اللَّهُ لِنُورِهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ Allah guides to His light whomsoever He wills. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone guides whomever He chooses from among His servants. That guidance comes solely from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if a person sincerely searches for guidance, they will find it. So those who open their hearts to the light will see it because it spreads far and wide in the heavens and the earth. It is permanent, unending, unscreened, and it never fades. Whenever the human heart looks for it, it is sure to find it. In the midst of his confusion, man can always find it providing guidance and establishing a bond between him and his Lord. So, يَهْدِ اللَّهُ لِنُورِهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides towards his light whomsoever he wills. And this is getting to a very important theme of the Qur'an, which is guidance is the realm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We as human beings do not have the ability to guide anyone. We can give people direction, we can bring them towards guidance. But true guidance in terms of changing a person's heart lies in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yahdi man yasha. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives guidance to whomsoever He wills. And this is a very, very profound concept and somewhat difficult concept to understand. And even the Prophet ﷺ was made to go through this challenge. That one of the most beloved people to him, his own uncle, Abu Talib, refused to accept this guidance. Even while he was on his deathbed. And this was something very, very difficult for the Prophet ﷺ. Because his uncle was extremely close to him. Right? The Prophet ﷺ grew up in the household of his uncle. His uncle treated him like his own son. And he spent a very long period of time with him. And then after accepting and becoming a prophet and messenger, his uncle provided him protection. He stood up for him, he defended him, he went through difficulties and hardships to safeguard the Prophet ﷺ and his followers. So when he's on his deathbed, the Prophet ﷺ comes and says that say one statement, that if you say the statement, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant you eternal salvation. And he's standing at his deathbed and he's encouraging him to do so. But at the same time, Abu Jahl and some of the other leaders of Quraysh are there and they're saying, how can you abandon the religion of your forefathers? And in the end, Abu Talib did not accept faith. He didn't make that statement. He didn't make that proclamation. And because of that, he died upon disbelief. 
And then the, the Prophet ﷺ felt this remorse, he felt this regret. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed Quran regarding that. That, that, إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي That you are not the one who gives guidance. Or you cannot give guidance to those whom you love. وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهِ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَى But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who gives guidance to whomsoever He wills. So one of the ways to understand that is that any human being, any human being that is searching for guidance with sincerity, right, with purpose, with intention, whoever is searching for that guidance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open up that guidance for them. So, يَهْدِ اللَّهُ لِنُورِهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيَضْرِبُ اللَّهُ الْأَمْثَالَ لِلنَّاسِ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives examples for mankind. وَاللَّهُ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمٍ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the knower of all things. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us these parables, these examples, to help clarify the concepts of iman and guidance, and to show them the path of faith and guidance. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains these abstract concepts to us in such a way that makes them feel concrete and real. That these examples, these parables, allow us to understand these difficult concepts in very simple terms. So again, faith is essentially an abstract concept. It's not something that we can actually feel and touch. So in order for us to have a deeper understanding of what faith truly is, in order to have somewhat of a perception of its true reality, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us these examples, He gives us these amthan. And they say, just look how beautiful this example of faith is. That faith is an abstract concept, it has no physical body, but this nur light is also an abstract concept. وَاللَّهُ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمٍ and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the knower of all things. He knows every single thing, big and small, physical and metaphysical, abstract and concrete. And He knows best who deserves to be guided and who deserves to be led astray. And they say that's one of the reasons why this is being mentioned and we're being reminded of this at the end of the verse. That wallahu bi kulli shay'in alim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge is infinite and limitless. He knows every single thing. So He knows best who is most deserving of guidance, and He knows best who is not deserving of that divine guidance and that light. Abu Sa'id al-Khudi radiallahu anhi narrated that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, hearts are of four kinds. That qalbu, uh, al-qulub arba'atun. Hearts are of four kinds. Qalbun ajrad, fihi mithlu siraji yuzhiru. The heart that is clear like a shining lamp, right? Qalbun ajrad, the heart that is clear, fihi mithlu siraj yuzhiru, is like is clear like a shining lamp. Then there's the heart that is covered and tied up. Wa qalbun aghlaf, marbutun ala ghilafihi, right? The heart that is covered and it's tied up as well. Wa qalbun mankusun, the heart that has been turned upside down. Wa qalbun musfahun. And the heart that is clad in armor. فَأَمَّا الْقَلْبُ الْأَجْرَدِ As for the clear heart, فَقَلْبُ الْمُؤْمِنِ سِرَاجُهُ فِيهِ نُورُهُ As for the clear heart, it is the heart of the believer in which is a lamp filled with light. Right? As for that clear heart, the illuminated heart, that is the heart of a believer that is filled with light. وَأَمَّا الْقَلْبُ الْأَغْلَفِ فَقَلْبُ الْكَافِرِ as for the covered heart, this is the heart of the disbeliever. وَأَمَّا الْقَلْبُ الْمَنْكُوسِ فَقَلْبُ الْمُنَافِقِ عَرَفَ ثُمَّ أَنْكَرَ As for the heart that's upside down, this is the heart of the hypocrite, who recognized the truth, then denied it. وَأَمَّا الْقَلْبُ الْمُصْفَحِ فَقَلْبُ فِيهِ إِيمَانٌ وَنِفَاقٌ As for the armor-clad heart, this is the heart in which there is both faith and hypocrisy. وَمَثَلُ الْإِيمَانِ فِيهِ كَمَثَلِ الْبَقْلَةِ يُمِدُّهَا الْمَاءُ الطَّيِّبِ The parable of faith in it is that of a legume, a sprout that is irrigated with good water. And the likeness of the hypocrisy in it is that of sores that are fed by blood and pus. Whichever of the two prevails is the characteristic that will dominate. So in this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ is explaining that human beings have different types of hearts. And when we're talking about the heart, we're not talking about the physical organ. Right? We're talking about the spiritual heart. 
which is considered to be the locus of iman and understanding and comprehension and tawakkul and sabr. Right? These are qualities, these are characteristics that aren't necessarily in the physical heart, the organ. Rather, they are in the spiritual heart. Regarding which the Prophet ﷺ told us that Ala inna fil jasati mudra, that inside of the body there's a lump of flesh. So the Prophet ﷺ described it as a lump of flesh so that we understand that it's, it's referring to something that's of central importance like the physical heart itself. إِذَا صَلَحَتْ صَلَحَ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّ That if this lump of flesh, or if, this, if, this, if this meat, if this lump of flesh is sound and healthy and pure, صَلَحَ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّ Then the entire body becomes sound, healthy, wholesome and pure as well. وَإِذَا فَسَدَتْ فَسَدَ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّ But if it becomes corrupt, if it becomes sick and unhealthy, then the entire body becomes corrupt and sick and unhealthy as well. أَنَا وَهِيَ الْقَلْبِ and that is the heart. And that is why this concept of tazkiyah, of, of purification of the heart and purification of the soul, is considered to be so important. It's actually one of the branches of Islam. It's one of the most essential uh, responsibilities of the Prophet wasallam. And, and, and clarifying and, and creating clarity within the heart is our responsibility. By trying our best to remove Blameworthy characteristics, blameworthy qualities like pride, arrogance, hypocrisy, hatred, jealousy, love of this world, love of popularity and fame. Trying to, to train ourselves to clean, cleanse our hearts from these qualities and characteristics. And trying to adorn our character with uh, praiseworthy qualities like humility and simplicity, generosity, kindness, patience and forbearance. And that is supposed to be a responsibility of each and every single one of us. All right, the light which spreads in abundance in the heavens and the earth is best seen in perfect clarity in the houses of Allah where people's hearts look up to Him, remember Him, stand in awe of Him, and dedicate themselves to Him in preference to all else. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then tells us where we are going to find those individuals whose hearts have been illuminated by faith and iman. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just gave us this beautiful description of iman, of this nur. And now he's going to give us an example or the location of this nur. That in this earth or on this earth, where are we going to find this light? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fi buyutin adhina Allahu an turfa' In houses that Allah has permitted to be raised and elevated. Wa yudhkara fi hasmu. And wherein his name is remembered. يُسَبِّحُنَهُ فِيهَا بِالْغُدُوِّ وَالْأَصَالِ He is glorified therein morning and evening. Meaning we are going to find the people of nur, the people of light, whose hearts have been illuminated with the light of faith, guidance in the Qur'an, in houses that Allah has permitted to be raised. فِي بُيُوتٍ أَذِينَ اللَّهُ أَن تُرْفَعْ And all of the commentators mention that the word buyut, the word houses here, is referring to the masajid. That we are going to find this nur, this divine light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the people whose hearts have been illuminated with this divine light inside of the masajid. For example, Qatada rahimullah he said, they are these masajid. Allah has commanded them to be built, established, honored and purified. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma commented, Al-masajidu buyutullahi fil ard. The masajid are the homes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this earth. Right? The houses are those masajid that are dedicated to the worship of Allah. And verily the masajid light up the earth for the inhabitants of the heavens, just as stars light up the heavens for the inhabitants of the earth. Right? Al-masajidu buyutullahi fil ard. Tudi'u li ahli samai kama tudi'u nujum li ahli al-ard. That the, 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 the masajid they illuminate the earth for the inhabitants of the heavens. Meaning when the angels look down upon this earth, they see a bunch of light. They see these stars. And that light and the stars they see are the masajid. كَمَا تُضِيءُ النُّجُومُ لِأَهْلِ الْأَرْضِ Just like when we look up in the sky and we see all of these shining stars. So the masjid is a place of nur. It's a place of guidance. It's a place of iman. The companions radiallahu anhuma, they used to say, the masajid are the houses of Allah and it is a right upon Allah to honor those who visit Him in them. 
right? The masajid are the houses of Allah. And it is a right upon Allah to honor those who visit Him in them. So the word adhina in this verse, right? Allahu an turfa. It comes from the word idhn, which means to allow or give permission. However, here in this context, it means commanded and ordered. Umira, Ibn Kathir rahimullah, mentions that it means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered us to establish masajid, to build them, honor them, fill them, and take care of them. So it is a direct command to establish, build, attend, and honor the masajid. And that's why the reward for helping to build a masjid is so great. Right? As the Prophet ﷺ says, مَنْ بَنَا لِلَّهِ مَسْجِدًا بَنَا اللَّهُ لَهُ بَيْتًا فِي الْجَنَّةِ that whoever builds a masjid for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah builds for them a house in paradise. And the word turfa in this verse carries two meanings, building and honoring. So, fi buyutin adhina Allahu an turfa. In houses, in places of worship, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded to be elevated, to be raised. So raised could mean like physical construction, building it. But the second meaning is honoring it. And the way we honor the masjid, more than helping build it and financially supporting it, is by participating in it. Is by being a member of that masjid, being a regular attendee of the masjid. Coming to the masjid on a daily, regular basis to establish prayer and remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what the last part of the verse explains. It explains the primary role, the primary purpose of the masjid. وَيُذْكَرَ fi hasmu. And where his name is remembered, his name is mentioned. يُسَبِّحُ لَهُ فِيهَا بِالْغُدُوِّ وَالْآصَالِ And where his name is remembered, and his purity, his perfection is pronounced in the morning and evening. So the masjid is a place where the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is remembered. And that is the entire purpose, that is the objective of a masjid. That whenever we come there, it reminds us of Allah. That the masajid have been built, they have been established to remind us about our Lord and Creator. And they say this remembrance includes all types of remembrance. Whether it's praying, reciting the Qur'an, teaching and learning about our religion, fiqh, hadith, tafsir, sermons and lectures. Anything that reminds us about our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. يُسَبِّحُ لَهُ فِيهَا بِالْغُدُوِّ وَالْآصَالِ His perfection is pronounced in the morning and evening, meaning the masjid is a place of prayer and worship. So through this, we learn that the primary purpose, the primary role of a masjid is to serve as a place for the remembrance and worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And after migrating to Medina, the first thing the Prophet ﷺ was seen doing in public was building a masjid. Imagine after taking, undertaking such a difficult journey, escaping from persecution and harassment in Mecca, the first public act that was seen by the Prophet ﷺ, or the first public act that he was seen doing is establishing and building a masjid. That he ﷺ himself would carry the bricks and stones that were used to build it. And the last place he was seen in public before leaving this world was the masjid. That three days before he passed away, Abu Bakr ﷺ was leading salah and the masjid was full of his companions. And the Prophet ﷺ's home was connected to the masjid. It actually opened into the mosque. And there was a curtain separating his house from the prayer hall. So the Prophet ﷺ opened the curtain, saw his best friend Abu Bakr an leading salah, and he saw that the masjid was full of his companions. And at this sight, he smiled in such a way that those who saw him said he smiled like the moon. Right? They compared him to the bright, full moon. He then drew the curtain and left this world three days later, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And between those ten years, right, between that first moment, of building and constructing the masjid with his own two hands. And that last moment where he was seen before leaving this world in the masjid, the Prophet ﷺ established it as the center of the Muslim community. It was the focal point of their lives. That it was the axis around which their lives revolved. It was the epicenter of everything that they did. So the masjid played a fundamental role in their daily lives. And that's why it is very, very disheartening and very troubling to see that for some reason, especially here in SoCal, there is a disconnect between the community and the masjid. That there's this huge gap. That for some reason, our masajid do not get full except on Fridays and in Ramadan. And outside of Ramadan, outside of Jumu'ah prayer, mainly or vast majority of the time, there's only a handful of people in the masjid. Right? And this is something that 
should create a level of concern in all of us, especially for those who are coming to the masjid. For those of us that participate and attend on a regular basis, it should create this sense of fikr, right? There should be this concern in our hearts that how can we connect people back to the masjid, right? أَحَبُّ الْبِلَادِ إِلَى اللَّهِ مَسَاجِدُهَا The most beloved pieces of land to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are its masajid. These are the places of guidance, of light, of faith, of nur. These are the clinics for the believers where person's iman can be recharged and strengthened and kept firm and strong. So part of our fikr, part of our concern should be how can we populate the masajid? How can we attach people's hearts to the masjid once again? So this new trend of being quote-unquote unmasked or being disenfranchised from the masjid is very troubling. And obviously our masajid, they do have issues, right? In the way that they're structured or the way that they're run or even how welcoming they may be. And everyone acknowledges that. Yes, we have shortcomings. The masajid have shortcomings. But they still serve the primary purpose as centers of worship, right? The primary purpose that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions here in this verse that is still being fulfilled. That these homes, these houses have been elevated for the remembrance of Allah. To serve as a place where we come and connect with our Lord and Creator and we are reminded about Him. So being disconnected from the masjid is a sign of spiritual weakness. That if a person is not connected to a mosque, it's, it's, it's an indication that there's some underlying deeper issue, that there's some sort of spiritual weakness, it shows that there's something wrong with our hearts. One of the seven people to be shaded on the Day of Judgment is a person whose heart is attached to the masjid. If our heart isn't attached to the masjid, we should be checking our hearts. And the importance of the masjid in our daily lives cannot be overemphasized. The masjid has to play a central role in our daily lives, even if that's as simple as coming for Isha prayer every single night. That it should be part of our daily routine, just like everything else we do, right? Just like it's work or school or working out or whatever else it may be, the masjid should be a part of our daily routine. It should be something that's just automatic. It's something that we are committed to. And the Prophet ﷺ told us in another hadith, a very beautiful hadith, that if you see a person frequenting the masjid, يَتَعَاهَدُ masjid, That they have this, this relationship that they're constantly coming to the masjid, فَاشْهَدُوا لَهُ iman then you can give witness, you can testify to that person's iman. That the fact that they're coming to the masjid on a regular and consistent basis is a sign that they have this iman in their heart, that their hearts have been illuminated. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that the masjid is basically the lighthouse of this earth. This is where we are going to find that divine light, that divine illumination, and how we are going to continue to fuel that light inside of our hearts. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inshallah to grant us all this nur. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to strengthen our iman, to strengthen our faith. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it shine bright and forth so that not only are our hearts illuminated, but we can also help illuminate others' hearts as well. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those who establish his masajid, who honor them by coming to them and, and praying in them and remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name in them and uh, declaring his perfection and glory in them morning and evening. All right, so we will stop here for tonight and we'll pick up from verse number uh, 37 next week, inshallah, which is a continuation. But we'll pick up from verse number 37 next week, inshallah, next Friday. All right, any questions before we end for tonight? Mm, not, not his grandfather, his uncle. <laughs>